Huh? What happened? Okay. Still got it? Yep. You know, the most difficult thing for any of us to do is to stop trying to change ourselves. To stop trying to improve ourselves. Isn't that difficult? We're all so eager to change something. You want to lose weight or stop cigarettes or whatever it might be, whatever your compulsions might be. We want to change that so badly. Uh, or being rude, for example. Being sharp. Being, being unpleasant. Have you have a habit of being unpleasant to other people? You can all raise your hand, every one of you. So we make a vow that we're going to do better next time, and we don't. But the point is, look at the difficulty of saying, I'm going to change this or change that. Look at the difficulty of abandoning your wish to break the habit, to change yourself, to overcome something inside as it, and of course it expresses itself outwardly. Look at the difficulty of saying something like this. I'm going to, the difficulty of saying, I'm going to abandon my attempts to conquer this habit. You're not going to abandon the attempts, are you? Because for a number of reasons, you see certain uh, certain benefits in keeping the habit, or whatever it is. All this is a part. I want to get back to the original point, which I started before Fred came in. The original point, could we deny it, add something else to what we always add with the relaxation and sitting back? And just talk very, very quietly tonight, unemotionally. And try to see, while we're sitting here, this isn't trying to change anything, this is trying to see something. The difference in the two? Hmm? Instead of trying to change anything, the way we ask questions, for example, simply watch myself getting ready. I, I go like that. Why can't I be one way or the other, either down or up? Can't I ask a simple and direct question, something that I really want to know about? Try to see how unnatural, how nervous we are, how, how some of you can't even ask a question at all because you're afraid of the sound of your own voice. Have you ever listened to your voice for the first time on a record player, not a record player, on a tape recorder? The first time, didn't it shock you a little bit? Do I sound like that? But the reason we sound like that, if we're sounding unpleasant or shrill or mutter mouth or whatever, is because we're not real. So this is what we're going to do tonight. Just sit back and talk. It's different. You may have a topic or I may have one. Just sit back and not force things, not try to be dynamic, not try to be emotional, not try to influence anyone, not to put on a pretense that we're really going to uh, get it tonight. Why do we need to say that? Can we just sit back so relaxed and real that we're not afraid of the, of the slow pace of the meeting? Ah, you like a lively meeting, don't you? Huh? You want one where there's lots of laughs, lots of feelings, lots of, lots of things for you to do with yourself while here at the meeting. Well, tonight, we will defy that tendency. And you watch and see the objections from your unreal nature that wants to perpetuate itself just by using this class itself.
this is not entertainment, and I'm sure that most of you know that, that this is not a theatrical production. We certainly do have laughs. We have good times here, and that has its place too. But can you be aware of the unreality of sometimes when a laugh comes up or something uh, interesting comes up in some way or another, can you be aware of how you latch onto that and like that and you feel a little more comfortable here than you did before? Mm -hmm. That means we have latched on, the unreal parts of us grab onto that and say, how nice, for the next five seconds I can chuckle or I can make a comment myself at someone so I don't have to sit back, so I don't have to get involved with real hard work, which is to sit back and do no work at all, but in a special way, of course. Because what's working in us, at most times in this class, what's working enormously hard is our own sickness. Do you know how hard the wrong parts of any of us might be working right now? Hmm? Do you know that you're working very, very hard right now, all of you, in the wrong way? Do you know, do you know what your feelings and, and minds are, are filled with? I'll tell you what they're filled with. With that incident that happened today and 50 years ago. Well, wait a minute. <coughs> all right. Let me give you something to write down. Want to hear something beautiful? More beautiful than any poem you've ever read or any symphony or any popular song you've ever heard? You just listen to the beauty of what you're going to hear now. I'll permit you to, to gasp with right emotion if you're capable of doing it. If you're capable. If you're not, you won't even hear what I'm going to say. Are we clear? Yeah, right. All right, uh, two sentences. The first one is as follows, and they follow each other. My confidence, hope, security, and acceptability can be destroyed, comma, but nothing can destroy my simple wish to begin again right now. I'll read that one again. My confidence, hope, security, and acceptability can be destroyed but nothing can destroy my simple wish to begin again right now. Last sentence. My mistake has no connection with my yearning. My mistake has no connection with my yearning. The yearning, of course, connects with the simple wish in the previous sentence. I'll read the whole thing again. My confidence, hope, security, and acceptability can be destroyed, but nothing can destroy my simple wish to begin again right now. How many of you are accepted by another human being in marriage or friendship or whatever, huh? How many of you are accepted by someone, huh? You like that, huh? You like the friendship, that's what's holding you together? Something's going to happen someday when you may not have that friendship. Some of you hoping, what's the other word, hope? Hoping for something from this class. All false hope is at the mercy of the truth in this class and we're out to eradicate it as fast as we can. But you don't know a false hope. You don't know a false hope until it is battered, which is another aim of this class. When I spoke of beauty, I meant this last sentence in particular. My mistake has no connection with my yearning. 
My mistake has no connection with my yearning. Doesn't that set you free of every, every problem, what we call in the future? Don't you see that right now, at five after seven, you're free from every quote mark future problem? Hmm? You don't see that? You do see that? Are you alive here tonight? <laughs> my mistake has no connection with my yearning. If you really saw that, you would go out of here in a new way. You'd be so overjoyed, rightly overjoyed. Because you would then see that nothing bad, nothing bad can ever, 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 ever really happen to you. Because that small bit of yearning, that wish to start over instantly, instant recovery, that is what is all powerful in your mind after you get disgraced, after you lose your money, after your career flops just as you're about to grab it. Don't you see what we've done in just six minutes? We've destroyed the power of mistakes, which it never had in the first place. But you know what we were? You know what we were. We were believers. We had faith in lies. We closed our eyes and said to the authority of lies, you're right and I'm wrong. The mistake is the lie that was wrong. What is real in us was right. Well, isn't that enough to think about till we come back again? Mm -hmm. Or do you want a lot of, uh, a lot of more excitement? You want a long talk? I will tell you, speaking for myself, I'm quite satisfied just to take that and think about it and do something that maybe, maybe you can't do. I don't know. Maybe you can. You can tell me. <sighs> just rest in it. Because it's not a part of me, thank God. My mistake, my error, my foolishness, my weakness, my blunder has no connection with my wish to find what is real. Now, don't ask for a lot of, lot of extra little things tonight. We're going to talk. We're going to have a complete meeting as, as always. But don't ask for uh, another platter full of food. Why don't you enjoy that one put before you for the rest of the evening by remembering it? Instead of saying, that's nice, well, I've got a note on it, and I'll look at it tonight, and you won't. That means I, I can live without concern. I can live without concern over my own stupidity. I know it's got me. There's no doubt about that. But now I begin to get a little bit of comprehension of what it means to take no thought for tomorrow. One way of looking at it. Boy. I'll tell you, how many of you are going to make mistakes tomorrow? <laughs> Why? Because we're mistake-creating machines as yet. We know that we're going to do it because we sense our weakness. We know if we did it once, we'll do it again. We'll do it three times. We'll do it 20 times. But I know that when I make that mistake tomorrow, I'm going to see it as a mistake, and I'm not going to wallow in it. I'm not going to uh, condemn myself. I'm not going to do anything but simply see 
that it was something that was unreal, something that therefore that jarred me, something that made me nervous. And I'm going to remember that this yearning to start life over, instant recovery, that that yearning is that one little bit of light of truth is more powerful than every blunder, stupidity, mistake, sin that every human being has ever committed, is committing, or will commit. Whether in me or in someone else. Doesn't that solve all your problems now? You have no more problems, huh? Hmm? This is because you don't really see what I just told you. You don't comprehend it. You're not living it. Well, then you'll have to learn the hard way. <clears throat> You'll have to learn that your irritable little natures of which you are so fond are unreal as far as truth is concerned. They seem very real to you because they're shaking your physical body and you identify with the physical body and you say, I feel good. What is happening is simply a vibration emotionally, physically, mentally, a vibration of some kind, you identify with that, you say, that is me, and you feel good. At the same time you feel good about it, you feel bad about it. And you're afraid of tomorrow. You're both praying for and praying against another mistake tomorrow, another shock tomorrow, another sorrow tomorrow. You're both praying. Now you, you listen. Listen to what I'm going to say. You pray, all of you, both for protection against and invitations to your pains tomorrow at the same time. So, so all you've got, then that's what you'll pray for. You'll pray for more of what you've had in the past. How are we, how are we ever, ever going to see that this unreal, artificial psychic system that we're living from is doing the exact opposite of what it seems to promise? I said, of what it seems to promise. And one thing it'll always promise, without fail, it'll always promise you a better tomorrow. And that is one of its most insidious of lies. All right, would you like to talk for a little bit? Ask questions on what we've covered so far. And I want you to please stick very close to the idea that your mistakes are not connected in any way with a little bit, I'm assuming you have a little bit of sincerity. Hmm? There's two things involved. Your thinking and that little bit of sincerity that is not a part of ordinary thought, not a part of ordinary thought, but wants to cancel out the ordinary thought of loving your mistakes, of fearing your mistakes, of feeling guilty over mistakes. Remember I said you're going to have to go, go, go a thousand times deeper into your sins in order to understand them? None of you saints are ever going to make it. None of you intellectuals are ever going to make it. None of you who take pride in being sarcastic are ever going to make it. 
<coughs> none of you, none of you who are trying to, trying to find and build security are ever going to make it. What you're going to do is see the mirage out in the desert and you're thirsty. You're very thirsty and you see the mirage and you're going to run toward it. That's going to recede in front of you. Therefore, unless you let me help you, unless you let me help you by screaming at you, I will give you up. So now you've come to a choice, haven't you? You will begin to, you will begin to value something that is not you or why waste time with you? Why bother with you? Personally, I wouldn't be here in this class at all if I wasn't getting something from it. As a matter of fact, should I tell you something? I would judge that I get a hundred times more every evening than you do. But you're starting. Okay, what would you like to talk about? Murray. After you left this morning, I got a, a nice shock. And it was that I slipped all the way through everything I said to you. You talk mechanically to me? Yeah. I was I was the talk. Okay. <clears throat> Do you know that you hate everybody you love? Do you know that? Do you know that? No. Yeah. Yeah. I saw another hand somewhere. Yes, Amy. A quote you gave about a month ago, the only, <coughs> the only genuine yearning is the yearning for truth. Yes, right. That builds very, very slow. We wander off off the main highway <coughs> ten times every block we walk down the highway. But we walk off and get hit and get hurt and someone calls us back. Someone who's staying on the highway calls us back but we don't want to hear because we're having so much fun out there at the party or at the money making or getting the medal. Do you know what a medal is? A medal is a visible brag. A medal is a visible brag. Aren't you relieved in a way that you weren't before you came here? To know that no matter how many mistakes, blunders, stupidities, errors you make, that if indeed you have this small beginning prince, remember? Prince who wants to grow into a king. If you have all this prince, that's all that counts. Think how dreadful it would be, every one of us now, think how horrible it would be if we, if we were in reality at the mercy of every mistake we've ever made since we were born. It's unimaginably horrible, isn't it? 
Aren't you glad that truth exists? What would we do without it? We would indeed be at the mercy of our own darkness. Oh, you still are? Oh, I see. If these things aren't understandable to some of you, maybe some of you who haven't been coming very long, they'll become clearer to you if you will continue to come back to the classes. You'll hear the same thing said in a different way, and it'll become clearer to you after a while. If you don't, then you'll have to stay off the side of the road and pay the penalty for wanting to con con continue in your wrong way. It's not easy, it's not easy at the start, it's not easy to defy the world out there and say, I've had enough of your lies. I'm so fed up with your lies. It's not easy because both the nature out there and our own inner nature, which corresponds to what's out there, wants to stay out and close her eyes and waltz around the ballroom, dreaming of romance and castles. Ah, the trouble is the orchestra only plays for about three minutes at a time. Then you have to open your eyes and see where you are, wandering around that big ballroom with the pretty lights overhead eyes half closed and semi-dark. You've got a girl and she's got a man and you're both terrified hanging on to each other. You're so scared you can't even look at each other in the eyes because you both suspect you both suspect that the other is a fake, just as you are a fake. All the Strauss waltzes can't prevent us from coming back to our own lonely little self. We might as well make up our mind that we're going to come back right now, get off the ballroom floor, floor face it. Because it's just not worth it out there. There's too much misery. There's too much lying. There's too much hope. There's too much hope and then knowing that that hope is going to get crushed. And even if you get what you want, you're still scared. day may come when you have made a long, hard, sustained effort to open your eyes and let go of the girl and walk off the ballroom floor and go outside and see where you have been all these years, you could uh, then have a very, very interesting experience, a fascinating experience. You know what you could do? When you have when you've walked outside and you've awakened, if you want and if circumstances make it right, you can walk right back into that ballroom, take the first girl and waltz merrily around the floor. But now, now, you can stop dancing when you want to. And you can look at the girl and nod politely, lead her off the floor because you're a gentleman, and walk out. Do you get the figure of speech, more or less? <clears throat> you can't do that now, can you? You ladies look all around that ballroom floor and all the wallflowers sitting on the edge in the chairs, looking for one who looks halfway decent. You're wearing your eyes out, aren't you? <laughs> He's not there, ladies. 
<laughs> You'll never find him there, ladies. You're not going to find him hardly anywhere, ladies. <laughs> I saw a hand somewhere, yes. Vernon, this is truly non-resistance, what you've been talking about. This. Well, not fighting, yeah. not fighting our mistakes, for example. Instead, just understanding them, that they represented a part, part of the parcel of the junky package called me. You've never made a mistake in your life, you know that? You've never made a mistake in your life. Never. There's no way you can make a mistake. You've attached yourself to false movements. That made a mistake, and so you say, I was foolish. I and my foolishness are one. Mm -hmm. Get rid of, of what you call yourself, then see what a difference there is. Then see how you're not scared of people anymore. Uh, go ahead, uh, Gordon. There's a lot of... Uh fear of exposing uh, a mechanical machine. In others and in ourselves? Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's giving away the, the show. It's turning on the lights in the ballroom and everybody sees how mean everybody else is because their faces are lighted up. It's kind of a two-part question. You mentioned before something about a false psychic system. Would that be the same as false personality? Of course. Okay. And is it this false psychic system that's in control? Because there's tremendous resistance in the body. Okay? So it's the false personality that controls and triggers off all the resistances that we go through. For freedom. Triggers off? Oh yes. Yeah. It's the, it's the, the whole thing is the false part of us. With its, with its thousands of expressions. Right. Just a minute, please. Remember, we're making a special effort, even if we don't understand, half understand what we're talking about, that's all right. We're going to make an effort just to be real tonight. Just. Just talk casually. Not suppressing surface personality, artificial personality, not suppressing it, but deliberately relaxing so as to defy it so it screams, so you can hear it scream and you can ignore it. Please. It probably really helps us to try to see through each other in this class because it's the only decent thing we can do for each other. And plus, if we can begin to see through ourselves and other people in this class, in this atmosphere, we'll be able to see through people out in the world much better. Oh, yes. By all means, let's use the raw material we've got here. <laughs> Pretty raw, huh? Aren't you tired of trying to please people? <clears throat> hmm? <clears throat> Neurosis is never satisfied Neurosis is never satisfied with the answers you give it, so why bother? You have someone in your life who's demanding things of you, accusing you, insisting that you behave a certain way. You're never going to please him. You're never going to please her. So why bother? I'm serious. Why bother trying to please someone who can't be pleased. Sickness can never be pleased. It, it thrives on being displeased. 
Why bother? Why don't, why don't you just get up and walk away? Hmm? You know what'll happen? They'll start chasing you. Yeah? They'll start chasing you. You've made them insecure. Mm -hmm. By refusing to go along with their sickness, you're not feeding it. Now they're hungry. I'm mm -hmm. not going to get fed there anymore. I better chase him or her. Then they'll change their tactics. They'll smile and sit a scowl. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing. But you have done what is right. In many ways, we have said the following. I'll give it to you again. Always dare to do what is right, regardless of the consequences. Always dare to do what is right, regardless of the consequences. And those consequences, uh, the, the fear of those consequences, whatever it might be, you losing this or losing that, are far deeper than you can imagine. But when it comes up, when the shock comes, that that person doesn't agree with you like he used to or whatever. You study that. You, you look at yourself and you look at that shock inside of you when that person suddenly changes. And it means you're not going to get the money, you're not going to get the sex, you're not going to get this or that. You watch that and that will be a turning point in your spiritual life. We, uh, you'll understand this, won't you? In these teachings, my destruction is my construction. You understand that, of course you do. <clears throat> Tell the world in its madness, go ahead, be as mad as you want. I'm not going to talk you. I'm not going to explain to you. I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to have any conversation with you at all. Please, please, dear sir or madam, do what you want. Please do anything you want to do. But I'm not going along with it. And then when they scream and threaten and cry, don't pay any attention. You just walk away. You must walk away, regardless of what happens to you. And you'll be scared for a while now because you've, you have begun to see more clearly your fear of defying the sickness of the world because you covered it up before by compromising, by going along with them. Now you've decided not to do that anymore the fear rises up and you see it much more clearly, don't you? Isn't that a good step? To see how afraid you were? Of course it is. Just keep walking away. Let them scream. Let the, let the insane world holler all at once. Let it threaten you all at once. Just keep walking away. Walk, walk, walk. It doesn't make any difference what happens. Because the only thing that can happen is something very bad to your misery. We don't see that. Having identified with our misery, we say, I've got to keep my misery. I don't want to give it up. I never want to give it up. But I can begin with this little yearning bit of light, begin to understand The decision has to be made sooner or later. Do it now. Stand, sit. Now, you might as well sit and be comfortable. Sit in the middle of the haunted house and let it collapse right down on your big tousled head. I don't know what tousled is, but it sounds good. Let it collapse right on top of you. And it'll collapse all around you, but it won't touch you. 
it'll collapse on all your bat furniture. Wasn't there a Batmobile at one time? <laughs> there has to be a bat furniture too. And it'll collapse on all the ghosts that were hovering around you and all the evil spirits. It'll collapse on them because that's where they belong, right in that haunted house. But when it collapses, it'll be all around you. You'll be safe right in the center and you'll see the pretty blue sky up there. I spend, I spend all day long looking for ways to collapse things. I do, indeed. I can't go fast enough. Let's take a 10 minute break. Write down a sentence, please. I really don't have to be interested in what they just said. <laughs> Delayed reaction. <laughs> I really don't have to be interested in what they just said. And I'm usually not. <laughs> but do you fake it a bit sometimes, Phyllis? Yeah. <laughs> now look, this is much deeper than you think. I really don't have to be interested in what they just said. Let's find out who the mysterious they is first. All right, write a second sentence. They is everyone. <laughs> they is everyone. When someone comes up to you and makes some kind of a statement about, you know, who's it about, guess who, about themselves. <laughs> They're not going to talk about you, that's your reservation. That they make some statement about themselves, and there's a certain very, very dumb, gullible part of us that listens as if it's important. You know how, have you ever felt that you're missing out in life? You know, you didn't see that movie that everybody raved about, or, you know, and so you're missing out in life. Well, this carries over into such little things as this. And someone makes a statement, and of course, way back in our minds, as Phyllis pointed out, we're really not interested. But somehow, even on the telephone, have you ever noticed how you, how you put up on a front on the telephone itself, they can't even see your face, but you go into it because you do it mechanically. I'm going to save you a lot of wasted energy and get you over a false guilt at the same time. How's about that? Two and one. From now on, you will listen carefully when you talk to people, and when they say something, you watch you watch and catch it, how you take that, you're very serious. They're telling you about this or that, they're, they're, they dropped their sewing basket last week. And the spools, the red one went this way, the blue one went that way, the green one went that way. And in your mind is all these sewing basket spools. And because it's important to her, you think you have to think about spools going by. You, write down a sentence. <laughs> I don't have to think about rolling spools. <laughs> now that's your example. All right, but more seriously. Before, before you start. Yes, go ahead, Alan. We get a false thrill. We get a identification, we get hypnotized by the smallest statement that another person can make, even in a casual conversation. And you may not think that you do this, and this is why I challenge you, I dare you, from now on, when you're listening to other people, how you think that you should be interested in what they're talking about. You don't have to waste energy when someone is just sitting there blabbing all about themselves. That one project alone will save you 10 kilowatts of psychic energy an hour. You may listen to them, but you don't have to waste your energy getting wrongly serious. You think that people who, a woman 
who is grown up so that a woman, what's a woman's average height, five feet four, or a man, five feet ten, you think that because they're tall people that they don't talk about little, like little people do, who are five and six years old. Big people have the same vanity as little people, only they hide it better. And what they, see, a, a little child in his bragging and he is, is, is naturally honest. He brags about himself and talks about himself, but he doesn't try to make you think that he's doing it for your sake, <coughs> as, a, as an adult does. Notice how people drop in little hints that they think it's for, uh, to make you think that, that you'll get something out of it. Watch, watch petty little lies of how they're telling you that you're going to get benefited by what they want to do, for example. All right, we're here for open discussion. We've got lots of time. Questions, uh, please. In listening to others talk, I noticed just today, being with the girl who I used to listen to, I listened emotionally and would not have Ah, uh, yes. And today, I just watched her, and you know what? It didn't matter whether I did it or not. She went straight ahead. <laughs> oh, no, you're not going to stop the other person. That's not the object. Except I wasn't drained. Taken over, yeah. yeah. You didn't jump into her the pool she stirred up. Yes, Frank. Yeah, I noticed something about my own mind when you said I really don't have to be interested in what they just said. I seem it seems to be like a little seed is planted and the mind comes up with examples like my own thoughts. That's what came to my mind first. I just noticed those. Yeah. You don't have to be interested in your own thoughts. No. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them, these vagabond thoughts, you're better off ignoring them. Please seems that this is one of the ways I like to please people, too, is by pretending that I'm really interested in what they're really talking about. Yes, yes. Let me ask you a, a question. Do you remember about a week ago when you and I waved each other across the village green? Uh-huh. Oh, for a minute I was disappointed. Oh, you didn't remember? <laughs> <laughs> you had some doubts. You remember that? Mm -hmm. What went through you? Anything in particular? No, not really. In a way, I felt like going up and talking to you, but then I, I thought, no, I'll drain his energy. I not do <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Linda, yes. Yeah. I thought you'd appreciate a little humor. My boyfriend told me last night that if Mr. Vernon could get you, like, I'm in the clouds because I'm coming to these classes, yeah. that our relationship would be all right. Mm. What? Uh, would you say that again? If uh, I would come out of the clouds with these classes, that our relationship would make it. It would, in other words, I'm very sick, and he understands how sick I am. He's going to help me by, you know, go along with what he believes is important. Well, what's he like? I saw another hand somewhere. <laughs> Only someone who understands the truth is mature. Otherwise, adults are just grown-up children in the everyday world. Well, of course they are. Do you know that little, little, small, vain little children are running this world? You should know that. They're running the governments of this world. Children in suits and dresses. <laughs> Little little girls in in big girl dresses are getting more prominent in running the world. Not that that makes it any better or any worse. Uh, psychopathy is neither female nor male. And you mentioned that you get a hundred times more from us than we get from you. I just wondered what you got from us. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> My own reactions. I don't really get anything from you. Anything I get from you would be bad for me. Right. <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> I'm watching reactions and I, I even watch bad manners and stuff like that. Suppression. Staring herrings. Etc. Yes, Frank. 
it's just a matter of reception what you're talking about getting a hundred times more than what we do it's all yeah. here we just don't hear as well as you do or uh, inside yeah this is a classroom for me too but I can get just as much walking down the street but in a different because I'm working in a different area maybe I'll ask you a question isn't isn't it a terrible horrible dreadful thing to be afraid yes. Yes. <coughs> right here in this class is the one chance you have to not be afraid anymore <coughs> now is that one item alone make it worthwhile Yes. But of course it connects with everything else. We know that. I've lived my life around terrified relatives, parents, friends, associates, and so of you. We're going to break out of it. No more. No more haunted house living. I don't... I don't care what we have to go through. We're going to do it. <clears throat> the world never makes anything hard on you, you understand? Not really. It's because we fear that world, because we value it falsely, that it appears that it is making things hard on us. Right here is my problem. Right there is yours. And that's the source of fear, falsely valuing what the world has and presents and promises, falsely valuing that, and then sensing but not giving up into the feeling that it can do nothing for us. We always want... We always want the alternative, don't we? You say, oh, I can give up the world, but let me be religious. No go. Sure, I'll give up the world. Let me have a collar around my front of my neck. No go. The weariness with this world is a hatred of the world and yet the weariness of the world must be a start. The time will come when the weariness will grow into something else because even weariness with the world is resistance against the world. But that's the start, that's the saturation we talked about. You've got nothing to give me, we tell the world. Uh, go ahead, please. Yes. So many times in the past several months, I have always thought I was going to leave a situation because it was uh, intolerable, but then something within me made me stand still. And now for some reason, rather the very thing that I was trying to leave seems to feel all right. And I'm never too sure. I don't think it's compromised, but it just feels differently, and I don't know what happened to it. Did you want that as a comment, just as a comment? No, I'm just making a statement. Okay, sure, fine, okay. Yeah. Yes, Jay? On Sunday, you made that statement that, do you remember when everybody was, when they got up to give their talks, they were looking at you for some kind of approval? <clears throat> you made the statement that men must stop doing that at a certain point, but women can do it forever. I don't really know how to phrase it. Do you remember that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you go into that a little bit more? Well, Joe hit it on the what, nail on the head. Is that for uh -huh. <laughs> When he said it had to do with strength, with developing strength. You men can learn from me if you want, but you're learning from me in order to develop your own strength altogether from yourself. A woman's in a different position. A woman must begin to 
and in many, many ways continue to rely on the strength of a man, if he has any. It's very simple, Jay. I don't see any need to go into it very deeply. Yes. A lady came up to me today, and she said that I was the only employee of the library who had not joined the State uh, Employees Association, and she wanted to know why. And I, I saw the nervousness, the tension, but I said, I'm simply not interested. But if I didn't have this class, I never would have had that strength. Yes. That's a form of it, intimidation. No. Well, why, why aren't you interested? You know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Shut it off for a minute. This, this tape may be sold in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I saw on the news show uh, a man being interviewed who had murdered somebody. And he said he was sorry it happened, but the man forced him to do it. <laughs> Which was interesting to see that if you do make a commitment, you know, you have to stick to it. He couldn't even say he was wrong in doing it. Mm -hmm. He had to stick to it. Okay. How many of you are sick? <laughs> Oh, you, you sickies get smart with me and I'll knock you down. <clears throat> Go ahead, Sal. Um, if I get jolted harder than I can handle, then the criminal in me takes over. Of course. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. See, see, a thousand times deeper than you do now. You made the verbal statement. That's one thing. And that's a necessary step. See much, much deeper how the criminal in you or anyone else takes over and then don't like being a criminal. And there's a part of you that doesn't like being a criminal. I saw a hand somewhere. Yes, Linda, please. Yeah, I'll tell you how sick <coughs> I am. As, as nuts as I know this man is, and I can't really stand to be around him, I'm afraid to leave him for the, for the security of not having anybody. I'm ready for that. Yeah. Why don't you try it as an experiment? Not that it'll do any good, because you'll just go to the next man of the same level. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, don't you attract the same kind of nuts all the time? Yeah. Huh? Why do you suppose that is? Because of what I have inside of me that I don't see yet. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Duffy. That's what I find the miracle of the ages, that for years and years I would suffer tremendous, and it was always the world outside me. And gradually, of coming here, I begin to see step by step that that enemy is with inside of me. And I have to admit it mm -hmm. that it's inside of me in order to see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That to me is a real salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, this new gentleman over here, what's your name, please? <coughs> the, the new gentleman, right there, yes. What's your name? I'm Frank. Frank? Frank? <coughs> yeah. Do you intend to come back to more classes or not? What, what's your opinion? Yeah, all right. If you do, you'll have to obey the rules on the $2 donation, which you didn't do tonight, after being asked I twice. I have 97 cents. Okay, I all right. John, she didn't tell me anything about the thing, and I have a master's choice. Don't give a speech, please. I said it's all right. Yes, please. Um, I didn't understand what you meant when you said when the criminal takes over, it will not like being a criminal. No, you, you said that wrong, Stella. Try again. I, di I didn't understand what you said, Henry. That's what I thought you said. No, well, see, see the criminal much more deeply in yourself and then let the part of you, the yearning part of you, not like the criminal. The criminal abides because another criminal likes him. They're all together in the thing. Let something higher than the criminal come. Go ahead. The agony was so unpleasant that I sought release through conversations. That what? Um, 
excuse me? No. <laughs> um, the unpleasantness was so uh, unpleasant that I sought release through conversations oh. with other people. Yeah, okay, fine. Change it, yeah. I had a chance last night to watch something come to, you know, that you've talked about. And that's that people that want to talk about this class, all they want to do is talk about it. I had brought a friend of mine here about a month ago, and he talked about it afterwards, and now he's back again. And I didn't say anything to him, but then he started talking to me about it. And I just told him that I didn't want to talk to him about it unless he, you know, was serious about coming back up here and he said no he didn't want to come back up here but he wanted to talk about it and so I knew if I didn't talk to him about it he'd you know get hostile and angry and so I just you know said I don't, don't want to talk about it and he did get hostile but you know that was the end of it. Oh, all right. That, that's that's a good point. Why do you suppose that people who come here and leave have a compulsion to talk about this class? What do you suppose is in back of it? <coughs> They're tied to it, aren't they? Yeah. Go ahead, Phil. I was going to say that they feel guilty for not coming back, and they feel the attraction. Yes, we get it in letters. I mentioned one the other day. People do it in letters. They do it personally. But they can't shut up about it. They're still tied to it. All right, you're on for anything. Murray. Do you take anything seriously other than evolution, your own evolution? That's first. Other serious things come down the line of importance, like brushing the teeth. Uh, <laughs> it seems like that Murray wants to take everything so seriously. Ah, that is Murray's false aim to be serious about brushing your teeth. Why don't you just brush them and, and ignore it? You think people... Do you know they're... What's up, Joe? That criminal in me pops up every once in a while. All right. Don't we build minor little gods, take them real serious, in order to serve as a diversion from authentically serious things which we're afraid to think about? Yeah. Hobbies, yeah. compulsions, whatever they might be. Uh, let's slow down, Rod, then, then you're on them. Isn't it nice not to have to be intelligent? Yes. Huh? Huh? Isn't it terrible to have to be intelligent? Dreadful. This is why we're so relieved at home, because we can be our own stupid selves. <laughs> Nobody notices <laughs> out here. <laughs> When you walked in tonight, you were fierce, apparently, very fierce, and it knocked, air, it knocked all the conversation out of the air, and I really reacted against that real strong. I was fierce to put you all in the right mood. If, if I was fierce on myself, I wouldn't mind that. I wouldn't react against it. But since I'm not fierce on myself, I hate it when somebody else is. Did you fear it? I reacted against it. I don't know if fear is the word. But Why do you let me scare you? <clears throat> You're such <clears throat> numbskulls. <clears throat> the nonsense has to be knocked out of you sometime at the start of a meeting. Because I can see by your faces which way you're going. I can see the little, I'll get over here in a minute. I can see the little arrogant imps in some, some of you. I can see it way across the room. I can see them beginning to want to have their way. No chance. Who, who, somebody? Yeah? When you, when you did that, I, I was obviously in terror because my reaction was terror. And at first I 
took it badly, and then I started thinking about it, and you exposed my terror that I was in at that moment. Too much lightness, and you'll start to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to be caught up short. do what we're supposed to be doing here tonight for the first time maybe to just speak without being afraid to speak up and what I wanted to say to the whole class was that if we can recall the tape about uh, the bat cave the talk on the bat cave how uh, people are kind of like an intersection for a lot of unconscious forces and these forces collect and manifest through the people. I saw that this person that's been my friend for five or six years, I saw that every time he comes over to my house recently, that he is these, these forces acting through him, trying to, trying to terrorize my life now. And I can see that so clearly it's, I think I'm communicating with a lot of people here. He's, uh, it's like a, he's like a doll, a mannequin with empty eyes, and there's this, uh, evil, evil force that, that comes through him every time it, he comes over to the house. Let me ask you, why does he come to your house? Is that a business necessity, or why? Uh, the harassment. That's the only thing I can see. You let him come over to arrest you? Well, <clears throat> are you afraid of him? He comes over. The person comes over very, very subtly and very artistically. He just—it's not. He's not blatant about it. The person comes over and tries to steal energy, <clears throat> time. Take, take me out of the work, involve me in, a, in a unnecessary things, and I'm just saying that I have seen the tactics of mechanicalness. You're still playing games with him, Tom. Write down a sentence. I will install a psychological lock on my house. I will install a psychological lock on my house. You're right about that, I still am. If you continue to make progress, the day will come. He will not come over anymore. He's still getting a reward from doing that. Yeah, now, yes, please. Yeah, yes. Me? Yes, please, Margaret. Right. I'm going to say this only because I'm a, I feel a fear of talking. But I'm not aware of any fear of you. However, I don't like get when you say things which don't seem to apply to me and use the term like you said you don't uh, you think that tomorrow will be a better they, day than today and I feel that it will be just another day I don't look for tomorrow to be any better or worse it's just going to be a day and I sort of feel a resentment when you sort of put Everybody in the same. Uh, uh, all right. Did you feel resentment when I said that? I don't like to be put in the box with everybody else if it doesn't apply to me. And I sort of interpret, or you sound to me like you're putting all of us in the same box. And I find a reaction. A I want to repeat the, the word I used. Did you have resentment when I said that? Yes. I ah, do. now we're getting more honest. Okay. Why did you have resentment? Don't you know that resentment is bad for you? Yes, I know it is. Um, and I'm sort of, I'm working on that now, wondering what the resentment is about. Do I resent the fact because I think of myself as an authority and you're coming across as an authority? I'm not sure what's going on, but there's got to be yeah. something that uh, it, in me is reacting to you because it's a reflection. 
All right, well, you do just one thing then for yourself. Study everything that we've just talked about. Yes. Isn't it marvelous that we can all make our own mistakes? Huh? Aren't, aren't you delighted that you can make your own mistakes? And learn from them? That's more profound than you think. When you said it doesn't make any difference what happens connects with what you just said. And if we can see our blunders and realize really that it doesn't make any difference what happens, you know, that's it. Write down a sentence. Connect to them. Who is it happening to? Who, who is it happening to? That tragedy? Who is it happening to? Find out and there won't be a tragedy. Because if you find out who it's happening to, you'll get rid of that who it's happening to. Uh, yes, Alan. I can see that I'm making the mistake of getting caught up in my mistakes. Non-recovery instead of instant recovery. That's pretty good, yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> uh, Ernesto. Okay, if I made the mistake and don't come back to these classes, <coughs> uh, who's paying for that? <laughs> who's paying for it? Yeah. Your chance to be an awakened human being. But you can't value being an awakened human being because you're not one to value it. You can begin to disvalue being the thing that causes you endless distress, which is Ernesto. Is Ernesto a big problem to you? I don't see so. <laughs> well, you keep coming to class. <laughs> Frank. One time that we don't even commit our own sins. Right. I didn't quite understand. I have a suspicion what it meant. You commit borrowed sins. Yes. Everybody goes down to the beer hall and gets drunk, so that's the thing to do, right? Right. right. And you go in there and you don't know what to do with yourself, but everybody else is doing it. You don't even know how to order beer. The bartender says, what brand? You don't know what brand. <laughs> but everybody else is sitting around having fun. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> you're, commi you're committing someone else's sin for them and with them and against yourself. You know, isn't it? To, uh, all right, Tom, we're both bursting, but... <laughs> this, this, this is right. This is really right. <laughs> I drove, I got to work, I pull up, I opened the door on my truck, and a red Camaro pulled out in front of me. And a uh, prostitute propositioned me right there. And I, and I said, I said in a hurry, in the hurry of walking into work, I said, no thank you, I've got to go to work. <laughs> and it occurred to me, all the things that were involved in that as I was walking into the hotel. Okay. Now my bursting point. <laughs> Isn't it terrible that everyone else, everyone we know, has more fun than we have? Doesn't that make you sad? Huh? Well, I'll tell you, in your case, Joan, everybody does have more fun than you. <laughs> she just laughs more. It makes me sad I'm mad. <laughs> She's going to go on strike. I'm just, she just hired me as her union representative. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very 
It's a very strong thing that won't die easily. Part of me knows that others are not really having more fun. If they have to tell everyone that they are or brag about what they're doing, they're not. And part of me knows from my own experience and looking back, it never really was any fun. But the part that won't let go is a, is a rough one. In spite of everything I've seen in myself, it's still, still rough to let it go. For example, any of you single people who wish you weren't, do you envy that ma happily married couple you see down the street? <laughs> well, I've got a little news for you. <laughs> Jean. I had the opportunity to be with a gal yesterday uh, who was getting ready to go to the ball in a long gown. And when I left her, I said, have a good time at the ball, and she was so thrilled that she was going to wear this long dress like a little kid going to play, and I was so happy that I wasn't going to the ball. I didn't realize it until after I said it, and I was going to the car, and it occurred to me that I was years ago I would have wanted to go to the ball. Do you like Guy, Guy Lombardo, Jean? Particularly. <laughs> 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 Ask her again. Ask her again. Well, I missed something. What? No, no, the rejection. You need to get another one. Oh. Do you, do you like Gar Lombardo? <laughs> no. No. Well, you've displeased me. <laughs> I'll, watch, I'll watch my reaction to that. <laughs> How long do I have to? <laughs> A long time. Yeah. <laughs> Intellectually, you know, I get a glimpse of, what, of the things that you say, but that doesn't have anything to do with anything. You don't know what hell is. That's your problem. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. You, none of you know what hell is. You, you have your false little heavens, mm -hmm. which prevents you from seeing hell fully, with a full blast of its heat. You are preventing yourselves from. No, all right, I'm gonna say it this way, but it's it's right. You're preventing yourselves from being scared to death. Now, I mean that esoterically. Scared to death. So scared that something happens to the you who is scared that it is put out of existence in your life. Well, why don't you get the hells over right now by detaching yourself from all the lovely people in your life, all the possessions, all the things that are making you feel secure? Why don't you enter the hell now before it comes about accidentally and jolts you and you resist it? It is the voluntary entrance into the hell of your own neurosis sickness that destroys it, not accidental encounters with it. When you encounter it accidentally, mechanically, then you crack up, you go to the nut house, you go to the psychiatrist, you feel sorry for yourself, you cry, you do all the wrong things. I saw a hand somewhere. Yes, Linda. You answered it by letting me know that it's my, I'm afraid to stand alone, even though I don't love the man. Right. What did uh, she say? She said that you answered it by letting her know that she's afraid to stand alone. Oh, yeah. yeah. All you can get from nutty people is nutty ideas and nutty relationships. But that's what the nut in me or you asks for. So we get what we pray for. Yes, Gordon. If I were really watching my states, I'd probably voluntarily be be seeing my hell, wouldn't I? Oh, yes. Yeah. 
You've got a raging one inside of you, Gordon. Not just Gordon, but I'm talking to you now. Oh, you're all raging. All of you are raging. Where can you be touched? Where we would see it. Yes, Duffy. One petty little thing can set me off in a tremendous rage. <clears throat> you get crabby all day, is that what you're saying? Yes. Nobody said it was an easy task. So with that in mind, are you going to miss any more meetings where you could be here? Or are you going to let daydreams carry you away when you're walking around the house, when you should be noticing that you're walking from here to there? Are you going to, are you going to simply fall into the terror of, of that ma uh, person who intimidates you instead of seeing that you're terrified? And then let that little yearning you want to be free of the terror do its work for you. You can't do anything for yourself. You can't save yourself. All you can do is give up trying to save yourself, which leaves the vacuum, which will be filled with something that is not of the criminal but of the prince. You're all quite convinced, unknowingly, that you can do something to save yourself. This is simply your mind operating. If your mind could do it, how come you haven't done it up to this 40, 50 years, however old you are? Make it worse, please, for your sake. Make your life worse than it is. It's too happy. Gordon. It's as if something's going on, going on, but I'm continuously away. I'm somewhere else. That's right. That's good. You're gone. Yeah. How many of you think you have unnatural facial expressions during the day with different people, you know? All right. The project until Friday night is as follows. You will notice when your face is lying. That doesn't mean you're, you're not pleasant or things like that. We're not talking about that. You will notice when your face is lying. And you can see it when it's forced or um, even scowling, of course, is lying. You will watch when your face is lying anytime it's in negativity or forced gaiety. All right, that's the first part. You will see it, and it's usually in relation to other people, although you can do it by yourself. Have you ever made faces to yourself when you're in your own private drama, when you're alone? You know, you're singing Pagliacci or something. All right, but whether alone or with other people, you will suddenly know that your face is lying and you will drop it. It will object, won't it? Yeah. Because it wants to keep going because you enjoy singing Pagliacci. You will stop it right in the middle and, and drop it. And that will produce the shock and that shock gives you the awareness of where you were. You were gone. Couldn't that also be rude if you're, if you're try listening to somebody talk and they're trying to. <coughs> that could be rude, also. A, a rude expression on your face, is you're saying? No, but if you're if you're in the middle of listening to somebody and you just drop into a, a glare. <laughs> <laughs> there is such thing. By, by the way, in case, and I suspect some of you don't know it, there is such thing as a natural, pleasant expression. There is such thing as being naturally pleasant. Now, is that news to some of you? I suspect it is. <laughs> Try it sometime. All right, good night. Good night.